Uh, friends, I'm glad to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. David Evanuel M. General. Uh, Dr. General is a university researcher, one at the UPLB Museum of Natural History, and is appointed as the museum's curator for ants. He finished his PhD by research uh, from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, and he specializes in entomology, particularly in ant taxonomy and diversity, but he also works on bumblebees and some obscure arachnids. Prior to joining the museum, Dave taught agriculture and forestry courses at the Palawan State University. He was also a research specialist program technician at the School of Forestry Resources at the University of Arkansas at Monticello, USA, where he also received his Master of Science in Forest Resources. Dave has authored, co-authored more than 20, art, 20 articles published in international journals since joining the museum in the late 2013 and described, co-described a significant number of new species and genera of ants. He received the 2020 Outstanding Junior Researcher Award from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Friends, let us all welcome Dr. Dave General. Dave. Thank you very much, Flor, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, this is my talk on working the night shift. The night shift meaning the ants that are active at night. There you go. <laughs> okay, I missed that button. So uh, my outline, uh, I will offer my acknowledgments and then I'll introduce the topic. I'll discuss the methods and modifications of the methods to deal with nocturnal ants, results in discussion, conclusions, and then my references and image attributions. This image, by the way, is the view of uh, Mount Isarog as we were proceeding to our study site. I'd like to acknowledge my companions and teammates in the field, Perry, Arvin, Jasmine, Inigo, Lillian, Emerson, Rolin, Royland and the MIGs of the Metro Naga Water District when we did this field work. Uh, I also thank Doc Arbs for the video and Jasmine Emerson and Inigo for the stills. My co-authors Lillian and Perry, UPLB MNH for the opportunity to conduct field work and to present the seminar. Uh, I'd also like to thank DNR, the Department of Environment, Natural Resources, Region 5, for issuing the gratuitous permit for us to be able to conduct this uh, field work. And for the PASU June Kabanayan for issuing the local permit for us to transport our specimens. Finally, uh, I'd like to thank UP System for the enhanced creative work and research grant that was given to me in 2018. Now, what are ants? They are insects that belong to order Hymenoptera which contain the wasps, the bees, and the ants, and family for the formicidae, which specifically contain only ants. Ants are sometimes considered to be wingless wasps. And we will see this in this line drawing of a male ant. Uh, of a, this is an endemic uh, genus and species, Nunilla copiosa from Palawan. Uh, clearly, it looks like a wasp, even though this is a male, so it has no sting. Ants usually have, or the female ants, have an elbowed antenna with a long antennal scape, which is the first segment of the antenna. Here in the male, it's just much shorter. Uh, ants also have a prognathous head, meaning the mandibles and mouth parts are in the anterior part of the head or facing forward. Ants also possess a metapleural gland, which only ants possess among all the insects. But some in ant species have uh, secondarily lost or done away with their metapleural gland. And also ants have a waist of uh, one or two specialized segments smaller than the rest of the body, separating the mesosoma and the gaster. And ants are eusocial insects. What does this mean? It means that they belong in, they live in colonies where there is an overlapping of generations, uh, the division of labor, and a reproductive caste or specialized reproductive individuals. Now let's look at the diversity of ants. In the fossil record, there are six subfamilies, 164 genera, and about almost 800 
species known. The extant ants, there are 17 subfamilies, 338 genera, and about 13,900 species, so far named. In the Philippines, we have 10 subfamilies represented, 100 genera, including two that are endemic to the Philippines, and so far 554 species. Uh, typically, uh, people consider uh, or think that ants, there are only two kinds of ants red and black ants. We have a few species in the Philippines that don't quite fit that classification. We have Polyrachis in the ventris, which is blue. We have a black and yellow or light yellow ant, Gisomermex luzonensis. We have an ant that looks like a strawberry, at least the head anyway. We have a yellow, black, and white ant, Camponotus albocinctus. And we have this ant that has a striking sculpture, even though it's black. It's shiny and uh, corrugated. Now let's look at the fossil ants. Ants have existed for 78 to 100 million years, uh, according to Barden, 2017. I will show you two ants from the Cretaceous period. This is Chiridris bite petulata. This is an image of the oldest known uh, ant specimen. And the uh, arrow A here points to an elongated antennal scape. And arrow B here points to the second segment of the, the waist, which is called the post petiole. And these two together uh, almost clearly show that this is an ant. Unfortunately, because it is an impression fossil, we can do nothing more with that, with that unless new technology is developed so that we can see the mandibles, which is hidden in the stone. This now is an amber intrusion of the, from the Cretaceous as well. Hydomir Max David Bowie. Uh, and this is clearly an ant with a petiole there and a um, first antennal segment escape. But what's striking here is that there is a dorsal lobe of the mandible and a new specimen has uh, shown that the mandibles actually uh, move up and down to capture prey and not side to side as what we would expect. So this is an ant called Hydomyrmex, belonging to the genus Hydomyrmex, which means hell ants. Now, we, are, we have looked at the mandibles of the hell ant. Let's look at the mandibles of some extant ants. This is Marshallis eureka. It is sister to all the ants uh, I think only three specimens have been collected so far. So we don't know what it does. And it has really strange mandibles. This one is Tomato Myrmex with his uh, sickle-shaped mandibles. It lives in Cuba and the Hispaniola group of islands and uses these sickle-shaped uh, mandibles to capture some very nasty uh, millipedes. This is Mestrum camile, which we have in the Philippines. The position of these mandibles is already post-strike uh, because this, this ant could, uh, actually strikes the prey by uh, locking their, the mandibles together and then snapping it just like that. And as the mandibles go past each other, it strikes the specimen or the, the prey at the side, stunning it or probably even killing it. Now, Myrmoteras has uh, mandibles that open 270 degrees, so basically towards the back edge of its eyes, and then it snaps shut and overlaps, uh, catching any soft bodied prey in range. Aretidris, which is the other uh, endemic genus of the Philippines, has a stemmed mandible and tiny denticles on the, on the edge or the margin. And we still don't know what it tries to catch, but it looks like it tries to catch some smooth, hard-bodied uh, prey like centipedes and millipedes. This is the, the familiar trap jaw ant that we have in the Philippines, one of 11 species of odontomachus. And the uh, mandibles open 180 degrees in that snapshot in one of the fastest known animal movements. This is myopia slobosa, 
with a strange uh, expanded mandibles, uh, we still don't know what it tries to catch or needs to catch with that type of mandible. And finally, Harpignathos, with very long curved and pointed mandibles that have a, a triangular flange at the bottom and about 50 denticles on each side. Now, why should we study nocturnal ants? Ants have no, uh, ter colonized all terrestrial habitats except the frigid poles and occupied every stratum of every habitat type. They likely develop temporal specialization. And nocturnal ants are known, but poorly collected and poorly studied. Sampling bias, which is addressed in the study, is a big reason for this knowledge, knowledge gap. Typically in the field, uh, ant workers or ant specialists, uh, researchers, collect ants only during the day. Now let me discuss the methods and materials and then the modifications that we need to do to uh, study nocturnal ants. We conducted a 100 meter transect of 10 plots, 10, 10 meters center to center and center to center distance and a five meter radius. Basically the, the plots were uh, tangent to each other. In these plots, we conducted pitfall trapping where we sank a plastic cup to its edge and then half filled with weak soapy water. Leaf litter sifting, we sifted the leaf litter from a one meter uh, quadrat and then uh, placed the siftate in Winkler bags for extraction. In beating, we marked five branches per plot and struck them five times over a one meter beating sheet and collected all the arthropods that fell on the sheep. Computation, we used the Jacquard similarity index, J equals A over A plus B plus C, where A is the common species to both collections and B or C unique to each collection. But the more interesting or more applicable number is the complement of the Jacquard similarity index, which is Jacquard distance, one minus J. Now let's see the modifications to the methods. In pitfall trapping, typically it is installed during the day, the pitfall, and it is run for 27 to 72 hours or longer, depending on the preservative. Uh, the modification for that is we install the pitfall at sun, before sunrise when it is still dark, and then retrieve the pitfall collection before sundown, and replace that immediately with new soapy water and then retrieve again uh, before sunrise the next day. For leaf litter sifting, typically that is done during the day, but for our methods, we collect, we do that during the day and then repeat that again at night, not necessarily the same leaf litter per plant. For beating of low vegetation, again, that's typically done in the day, but for our methods, we modified it by selecting and labeling branches with numbered flagging tape and then we beat branches during the day and again at night. So when I mentioned pitfall trapping, like for example when I was applying for my permit, people think this is what I do. Uh, this is a pitfall trap for catching rhinos in Sarawak, I think it is. So that's not really what we do. This is what we do. Uh, notice the pitfall trap there in the red circle. That is a plastic cup sink to its edge in, in the ground. That's it. So we collect only ants and small arthropods. Uh, small herbs and other animals can get out very easily. For leaf litter sifting, I'll show you a video. Okay, after all that exercise, we place the sifted material uh, in thin porous envelopes here in the bags and then allow the, the material to dry out. As the material dries out inside the bag, the arthropods and ants fall into a, pot, a jar here at the bottom that has alcohol. So they are killed and preserved immediately. That is run for about 24 hours to 36 hours. 
or even longer if you want. Now let's look at the necessities for collecting nocturnal or boreal ants. We need a team. And the team is composed of one striker, the guy who hits the branches, one sheet guy, the guy who uh, holds on to the beating sheet, and one secretary, this is important. And two, uh, two to four other people who will help collect the uh, ants and arthropods on the sheet. We also need lots of flagging tape, a field notebook, marker pen to number the flagging tape, and each member must have a pair of forceps. This is what it looks like during the day. Uh, so we have basically have a person on each side of the beating sheet and helping to collect the ants on that sheet. Now let's look at the daytime view. This is a plot where we have marked branches with long flagging tape that are numbered. There are supposed to be five. Can you see the third and the, the fourth and the fifth? I think there's one here and there's one there. Let's look at the night view. It's completely different. Uh, this long ribbon here has disappeared in this view. It's still the same view because you look at that vine going across behind this big tree here. And you have that vine and this tree here. This one has appeared. That's probably this little one here. So it's really necessary to have long flagging tape so you can find them even though this one you see has already disappeared. By the change of angle, some of these will disappear and you need to number them so that you can keep track. So the difference is really day and night. I will show you a video now of what we did in one of those, with one of those branches. <laughs> this is the night beating sampling of the hand people. Okay, go. When in doubt, dump it. Okay, notice that uh, the terrain is not even. I was high up there. The guy with the sheet was a little lower and then everybody else was lower, even lower than that. Uh, that's why you have to rec reconnoiter or uh, walk the transect during the day. Now this is the result. From pitfalls, we found four diurnal species and eight nocturnal, and nine that are both diurnal and nocturnal. In the leaf litter, we found 12 diurnal, 15 nocturnal, and 25 active day and night. And in beating, we found 18 diurnal, 14 nocturnal, and five day and night. In pool, when we pull them together, it doesn't look like much, 34 diurnal, 20, sorry, 27 nocturnal, 39 active day and night. In the summary table, we can see uh, all this data put together in, a, in one screen. If you conduct the transect with the typical daytime collecting methods, this is the data you will get. That's all. Look at the amount of data we still have to show you. Now, by conducting our uh, transect this way, we find the pitfall numbers of uh, they, they are not only, that was unique to our, our data set. And also this one, both day and night active, leaf litter and beating, unique to our data set as well. 
And of course, this column here is also unique to our data set. And interestingly, uh, the Jacquard distance for beating is 0 0.85, which suggests that clearly that there may, well, suggests that there may be a distinct nocturnal arboreal community of ants. Now, why should ants be nocturnal? Well, first, they may avoid predation. This is a, a species of Draco flying lizards. There are, I think, 10 species of these lizards in the Philippines. And all these Draco species are either facultative or obligate predators of ants. They are ant specialists. So it makes sense to try to avoid these predators. However, at night, there are other predators that happen. Uh, don't ask me to pronounce that name, but there are many nocturnal frogs, arboreal frogs, that could possibly be eating ants. Another reason is they may avoid, uh, the ants may avoid competition. It makes sense that plants offer bribes to ants in the, main, in the way of uh, extra floral nectaries or food bodies. And they offer that during the day. It makes sense that they may offer that at night as well to nocturnal ants. And these nocturnal ants may take advantage of these without other ants being around. Also, they may avoid competition for prey, such as this uh, famous nocturnal ant, Nothomyrmisia macrops in Australia. Uh, this ant was uh, discovered in 1934, and then they failed to re-find it again, recollect it for about three decades, until somebody answered the call of nature in the field, or got out of his tent, and saw this ant in the bush at night. So that is how they found this famous nocturnal ant. Now it's easy to find as long as you go out at night. Now let me uh, discuss a genus that we found in our nocturnal collection. Genus Vombicidris is rarely collected. Uh, the range is from China all the way to New Guinea and uh, Australia. The Philippines has one known species before this study and is known by its unique dentition meaning to say the teeth on its mandible edge. It has a large apical tooth followed by two smaller teeth and then a large diastema or a gap, which is about the width of the two smaller teeth and then two more basal teeth. This is the headshot of uh, the vombicidris we found that night. Uh, I will try to show you the teeth going from the bottom to the top. You have a large apical tooth you have two smaller teeth. You have that diastema. I think it can be shown here, but there may be shadow. And then one of the basal teeth. The, the blue dotted line uh, follows the margin, more or less, follows the margin of the basal margin of the mandible. And the second basal tooth is hidden behind this plate called the clypeus. In the side of the head, Vombis idris ants have this groove that is long and straight or sinuate be below the compound eye. There is one species or maybe a couple of species that have reduced or absent groove, but they still have that uh, unique dentition. This is the species that I described from that night's collection, Wombicidris freae, which I named after my only grandchild, uh, granddaughter, Freya. Now, it's interesting because uh, it is bright yellow, actually it's gold, and it's so reflective that in the imaging of this species, the lighting had to be so manipulated that the background is now dark. What's interesting also or important is that the be temporal behavior of this ant has been recorded by the label, where we now have a label that says nocturnal beating of low vegetation. So it is possible to record and indicate the temporal behavior of specimens at the labels. Now let's, uh, let me show you the, or discuss with you the best practices for collecting nocturnal arboreal ants. First, you must re reconnoiter the entire transect. So take notice of the terrain and so that you know where to stand and how to avoid falling in or tripping or whatever. 
you must label the branches with long numbered flagging tape so that you can keep track. You need a secretary. This is very important. Keep track of branches uh, because everybody's busy. There must be one who is uh, assigned to this task of keeping track and also to keep the vials. You must prepare the vials and label them beforehand. And communication is important uh, with each other, especially at night. Finally, you must retrieve the flagging so that you don't leave a lot of plastic hanging around in the locality. For conclusions, uh, it is possible to separately collect diurnal from nocturnal ants, and even for student thesis projects. In fact, I have advised some thesis projects where they were happy to do this and very successful. Temporal behavior of the ants can be permanently recorded in the labels. And discoveries of new species is possible when sampling nocturnal ants. Finally, the knowledge gap on temporal behavior can be addressed. These are my references. These are the, in, this is the image attribution table for all those images that I used. And thank you very much for listening. I will not stop my share. All right, thank you very much, Dave. Sir Dave, for that um, interesting uh, presentation. I guess a lot of our uh, uh, insect-loving guys, lovers there out there, and researchers are uh, kind of excited, you know, to ask you some of the questions. But before that, we will, as promised, we will be having a short quiz so that uh, more of our audience can prepare their own questions. So uh, let me just uh, share my, my my screen. The first question is: We have one out of five ants can be considered wingless wasps. The statement is true or false? And time's up. 86% of you answered true. And the option A is correct. Congratulations. For the second question, the number of ant species known in the Philippines is 788. 554 and 13,909. And, ah, uh, okay. 51%, half of you answered the uh, option B, 554. Let's see what is correct. And, Yes, uh, option B is the right answer. Third question, nocturnal ants are poorly studied because of what? Sampling bias, they are impossible to collect and uh, scientists need to rest at night. A lot of you answered sampling bias. Let's see, and option A is the correct answer. Fourth question, nocturnal collection of arboreal ants is a team activity. The statement is true or false? Nakita nyo naman sa video, malamang, no? All right. <laughs> okay, of course, 97% got it right. It's true. Uh, when you collect ants in the uh, during night, uh, it's best to have a team with you. And the last question, the genus of the newly described ant is Volvariella, Vampiria, Vombicidris, or Volenhovia. Okay, the answer is Vombicidris. Congratulations. Let's see the leaderboard. And Deo got, wow, Deo got five out of five in just 22 seconds. Congratulations. And uh, uh, 
Uh, on a close second is LJ, who also got uh, five out of five, but uh, is uh, eight seconds behind. So maraming salam. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this quiz. Thank you very much, Dale, for topping our quiz today. Let's go to our question and answer uh, open forum. I hope um, some of you have already put your uh, uh, questions in the chat box. Let's see our chat box. Okay. So uh, we have one question here from uh, Judith Chavez. Um, in case that they need to ID some collected ants, can we request or ask your help? How po? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that question. Yes, you may ask for help. Uh, you can either send the specimens to UPLB Museum of Natural History, care of myself, or if uh, that's not practical, another way is for you to image the specimens through your uh, stereo microscope and using your cell phone. You can capture images of those and maybe we can do uh, initial uh, identification that at least the genus of your specimens. But it's better to send the specimens because then uh, you will have a greater chance of uh, proper identification. Thank right. you. Thank you, Ma'am Judith, uh, for your question. And uh, okay, we have a question from Jose Adrian Miguel Maestral. And um, if there are nocturnal and uh, diurnal ants, were, were there cases of crepuscular ants or sp uh, species that are active at dawn and dusk? So he gave an example, like crepuscular animals like koalas. Are, are there ants that um, follow that kind of behavior? Uh, that's probably a finer uh, division of uh, the diurnal or nocturnal ants. But I really doubt it because uh, I have seen behaviors of nocturnal ants where they disappear during the day. They completely disappear and they don't look around, is it dark enough for us to get out? Is it light enough for us to get out? I don't think that's the way it is. It's either dark or light. Mm -hmm. There's no in between like crepuscular ants. I don't think so anyway, unless you want to conduct the research to do that. Yeah, magbantay siya sa ano, no? Sa isang, <laughs> you could actually go to, to a nest and then the, you know, time, time with, whether they're coming out or to forage or something like that. So this is actually a comment from Gloria Nelvis. Uh, uh, she's just, just thanking uh, for this good, this, uh, thank you, thanking us for this uh, discussion today. A uh, question from Hernando, Hernando Mon Mondal, and he asked, when you established the transect line, uh, were you able to make uh, replications per station? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, actually, we do not replicate the we, we can run another transect a uh, certain distance, maybe 100 meters away yeah, at the same elevation. Or better yet, you conduct another transect line uh, at least 100 meters greater in elevation. So there must be a separation of about 100 meters. The reason we do not replicate along the same line is that uh, we also conduct destructive sampling. We collect ant nests. And once you've collected that nest, you have destroyed the nest. And there's no likely the likelihood that you will find another species in the same nest uh, a few hours or a day later. Uh, now, it's also possible to conduct a replicate transect line, but at least 100 meters distant from your original line along the same elevation. Uh, again, I, I suggest that you conduct a transect line higher up or lower. Uh, instead, mm -hmm. you have an elevational gradient. That's, that's probably better. Okay. Thank you. Uh, question from Daryl Salas. Uh, he's asking, what are the species of ants found in uh, ant plant species? Are they nocturnal or diurnal species? Ant plants. And plants. Yes, thank you, Daryl. I will throw that back to you because <laughs> you are interested in ant plants. You might want to uh, 
sit down beside a, an ant plant and then see if they're active during the day and at night. You might have to bring some more uh, DEET or OFF and then some lighting and some food and drink while you make that observation. I will expect you to conduct your own exper <laughs> your experiments for that. Uh, we don't really know because uh, basically, if you notice our collecting method, we did not search for ant plants. Mm -hmm. We just searched for the brand, those ants that are running around on the branches. Whether but they were ant plant or plant ant plant ants or not, we don't know. Okay. We didn't search. Right. Thank you. So um uh Question from Jose Adrian Miguel Maestral, and uh, he's he's asking this uh, on behalf of a relative. Why are red ants harmful than their black ant cousins? <laughs> well, I beg to disagree. Mm -hmm. There are a number of black ants which are also harmful. In fact, in in Australia, the jack jumper ants are colored black, and they can land you in the hospital if you get stung and you have a severe anaphylactic shock or allergic reaction, and they are black. <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's not the color, it's the venom or the sting that they will inject you with. Here in the Philippines, uh, mayroon bang ganong counterpart, like uh, black ants that are you know, very detrimental to uh, humans? Um, we have the, the trap jaw ants, which mm -hmm. uh, deliver a powerful sting. And, uh, but they will not land you in the hospital. Mm. No. They'll, they will tell you that they're there. They will give you a really strong shock of pain, but that pain is uh, temporary. Maybe it will be gone in about a minute or so. If you, so the secret there is you do not rub or touch or scratch the sting area if you got stung by odontomachus trapped your ants. You leave it alone. After about a minute or so, that sting area will go cold. It will feel cold for a second, and then it will be numb. After that, no more, nothing. Oh, okay, so to all of those uh, you know, working with ants, I think you know that uh, protocol already. A uh, question from Francis John Set Albacite, and uh, he's asking how reliable would the study be if the only collection method done is just a pitfall trapping uh, due, to due to cost constraints? That's the first question. Okay. Uh, reliability, it's going to be reliable as long as you do not apply bias. In other words, you do not select where you're going to put the pitfall trap. Maybe this mm -hmm. is a good sign. Or you do not look for an ant trail and then you put the pitfall trap beside it. Uh, if your study is simply pitfall trapping, then that's what you mentioned in your methods. And that's the only data that you will get. So that's all that you will analyze. You cannot uh, make any conclusions or suggestions about arboreal ants or, or any other uh, part of the community that you have not studied. Yes, okay. So uh, his um, second question, is it possible or would is it possible for a private researcher or an amateur or a hobbyist without a formal affiliation to publish biodiversity or inventory studies? I think uh, uh, focusing on ants. Uh, by all means, as long as you have the necessary permits. Mm. Uh, see, you need permits to be able to work on our wildlife. Without those permits, then uh, you're now in the gray zone of uh, being a poacher, actually. So as long as you have permits, by all means, you can conduct your studies. You can do it on your head if you want. You can wear colorful clothes. It doesn't matter. You can wear mismatched clothes. It still doesn't matter. As long as you have the permits, you can conduct your studies and publish. And as long as you are uh, not applying too much bias, or uh, being honest about your data and your results. I think it's fine. It could be. Right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francis, for, the, uh, for those two questions. Question from uh, Paul Hendrick, Goho Cruz uh, from CLSU. He's asking if there are also marked differences in ant species composition 
during the dry season and wet season? Yes, I think there would be, uh, especially in central Luzon where there is an extremely dry period. Uh, most ants will probably go underground. They will transfer from their twig nests and then nest underground. So you will not necessarily encounter them. Or another possible result of the long dry seasons in uh, the central Luzon area is that the ants will die. But more likely they will just go underground where it is more moist and probably cooler than what you would experience as a human being on the surface. So you will have to, to be able to uh, study those ants during the dry season, you will have to now deal with the possibility or the reality that they have gone underground. Uh, thank you, Aron, uh, from Ronald Kadawan Fabros. And uh, sir, can you recommend any reference in identifying ant species in the Philippines? Yes, you can Google General and Alpert 2011. Yes, 2011. Such a, where, what publications? Uh, um, oh, yeah, you can easily Google Zuo Keys, Z O O K E Y S 200. It's a special issue. So all you have to remember is the number 200. And you will have a bunch of choices for downloading that from Zuo Keys. It is open source. It's also a very large file. I cannot send it to you. It's about 58 meg. Okay. So um, just go to uh, Zoo Keys, uh, Ronald. Okay. Uh, follow up question from uh, Mr. Maestral. He's just uh, asking whether that, that black ant from Australia that you've mentioned is that uh, the bullet ant? No, negative. The bullet ant is found in Central America, Parvaponera. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, Paraponera clavata. Uh, the ants in Australia are belong to the genus Myrmisha. They are entirely different. They they belong to an entirely different subfamily. Okay, thank you. Um, from Carl Vivero, will colonies kept in uh, kept in captivity drastically behave differently from those that are found in the wild? I don't know uh, because I don't keep col colonies, but certainly their behavior will be different. You have entirely different uh, environment for those ants kept in captivity. You cannot accept, expect them to behave as they would in the wild. A question from Damsel Quesada. And uh, um, what is the most effective method for determining ant diversity in a specific sampling site okay damsel uh, thank you for that question uh because ants occupy all sorts of uh, strata and have temporal behavior as well a combin a combination of collecting methods is necessary for a comprehensive uh, view of the ant community of that locality however if you are limited in resources then you can do either just pitfall or uh leaf litter sifting or beating or a combination of those and deal with the limited data as you have. And you cannot claim that, oh, since I conducted 500 pitfall trapping sessions, this is the most comprehensive. Well, not necessarily because each method has its own limitation. And the reason you do a suite of methods is to make a comprehensive collection, which you will not be able to do with one or two methods only. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jay Mar Amoncho said that uh, he managed to catch two odontoponera uh, denticulata queens and they have their larva right now. So uh, he's asking if this uh, species is uh, polyg polyginous. polyginous. Uh, do you really want to find out by keeping them together? In other words, uh, what do you intend to do? Do you intend to keep them? If, if so, then I suggest you separate those two queens. Okay. Is that, is that, does that answer your question? 
I hope it answers your question, Jamar. Ha? So, paghiwalayin mo na lang daw sila. Why? Yeah, uh, honest question from me, sir. Why? Well, if it turns out that they're not polygynous, you will find one of them dead. I see. So, para siya, mag- mag-aaway ba sila? So, papatayin ng mga kasamang workers. I see. Okay. So, well, uh, Jmar, all you have to do is to do your experiment <laughs> to see if they're poly- polygynous. All right. So, Carl Vivero, um, I think this is a general question. I probably could uh, breeze through this question. Ano po yung process, proper process in gaining uh, a permit? Okay, first you determine if uh, your locality is a protected area. If so, then you will have to apply to the Protected Area Management Board. And then they will, uh, if they approve your, your study, they will then forward that to the regional office. But I suggest uh, it's easier to get in touch with your regional DNR office and start from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, from John Allen, the Kui Kui, and he's asking, what data can we get from pitfall trapping if we're only targeting arboreal ants? <laughs> Will there be no bias if we, use, if we use pitfall trapping since we're only focusing on arboreal ants and not including uh, terrestrial ants? So, okay. Well, just okay. clarify na lang. Uh, trying to collect arboreal ants using pitfall traps is uh, similar to trying to uh, collect dolphins using a shotgun. Uh, they don't intersect. So you have to catch the ants where they are. Now, if you're going to do uh, pitfall trapping for arboreal ants, you have to find a way to put your pitfall trap somewhere in the tree. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then you have to deal, know how to deal with a bunch of zeros that you will uh, probably collect. I don't know. I've never done it. But that's interesting. If you want to do arboreal pitfall traps, you can Google that and see different designs of uh, arboreal traps that people have tried. And maybe you will find some interesting things. Pwede nga naman, no? Lagay siya ng plastic cup sa puno. Yeah, yeah you have to tie it somehow and, uh-huh. and keep it there and hope that ants will fall in. Or probably one one thing that you could do, John Allen, is to you know uh, make some sort of study, you know, efficacy rates, something like that. You know, checking whether you know uh, pitfall traps are really they have this some sort of a uh, uh, effectivity when used in arboreal settings. So uh, from our director, Dr. Marian De Leon, he she is asking, do we have enough data to publish? The ants of the Philippines. Uh, that's a good question, Director Marian. Unfortunately, the answer is no. There are many, many areas for which we have no data about the ants. Uh, my data uh, alone has a very coarse resolution, uh, island distributions. Now, when you look at an island, say in summer, I have a list of species known from summer. But where they are in summer, I may not be sure. So we, we still need to do a lot of field work. A lot of people have to contribute their data. And maybe a few more islands should be collected. In my data set, I have about 34 islands in my data set. Uh, slightly less than 7,600 islands. I still have more time to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> More time and more work. More From work. this year, uh, Oliver Mapile uh, asking, what are your recommendations for high school research uh, that, that would be focusing on insects or ants and other invertebrates? So you could probably uh, some, some topics that you could uh, recommend for them, for high school yeah. students? Yes, yeah. you, can, you can do a pitfall, temporal pitfall study in your, even in your campus. Uh, and run maybe five stations where you will put put a pitfall during the day and then in the afternoon or early in the day, in the afternoon, retrieve those and then uh, replace the liquid with fresh liquid and then uh, put those straps out again and retrieve them early in the morning. 
uh, the problem there is uh, maybe you'll have to do that during the weekend so there are fewer people in the school. But a pitfall, a temporal pitfall study is uh, fine for a high school research study. And you'll probably be seeing uh, differences in ants that are active during the day and ants active during the night. All right. Mm, a question, uh, actually, this is a comment from Marian uh, Tagoon, and uh, she's just saying that uh, they have found in their study that uh, ants have high index of relative importance as prey items for anurans, uh, both generalists and specialists, uh, in their study site. Now that's good to know. Thank you for that. So um, another another question. It's uh, from April Rose Monding, and uh, aside from pitfall trapping, uh, they wanted to use uh, baits in their methods of collection in their methods of collecting ants. What could be the best bait for when baiting ants in a forested area? Okay, um, thank you for that question. Uh, baiting is a time sensitive method. Uh, when you place baits, you must recover the baits in the ants that have attract, uh, been attracted within two hours of laying them out, two hours. If you're not able to do that, then I'd suggest you do not do baiting. Uh, or if you're going to do baiting, their transect line must be relatively short so that after laying your baits, you'll be able to recover them after two hours. Uh, what, what baits would you like to do? Um, there's a possibility of uh, some ants being attracted only to sugars and some ants being attracted only to um, salty or uh, protein. So you might want to either combine sugar and protein by mashing up some, uh, and oils as well, mashing up some canned tuna or canned sardines and add sugar. I know it might taste nasty, but if you're going to be uh, having only one line of baits, then mm -hmm. you might want to be able to attract those that are attracted to sugars, those attracted to proteins, those attracted to oils. Or if you want to separate them, then you'll have three different baits. But again, the time limit is two hours. Anything longer than that, what will happen is the ants that have found your baits early but are not dominant will be driven away by the dominant ants that find the baits later. So if you collect your baits after two hours, you will most likely be collecting the dominant ants only, mm -hmm. not the early finders. There's a difference. There are early finders who can be driven away easily by the more dominant ants, who probably will find the bait much later. So that will skew your data. If you uh, decide to take a coffee break after laying down your baits, well, you will not have a good data set. I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, April, for that for that question a uh, question from nelson javier uh sir do you advise ants as pets because he saw one time um on tv you a blogger having an enclosure with uh, an enclosure of an ant colony um uh, yeah well okay it, it depends on you no uh there are people who like to keep little things as pets but remember that uh, there are ants that can escape and ants will try to find a way to escape. And that is your, going to be your problem. Uh, so basically it's really up to you. Um, if you want to keep pest ants, which is fine, but if you want to keep native ants, I would probably discourage you that from doing that because uh, then you're dealing with wildlife. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, out of curiosity, magkano kaya maging hobbyist or ant keeper? Would it run to how much? It will run into the thousands uh, because you will have, of course, uh, investment in time capturing these ants. And then maybe they will die and have to do that again. Mm -hmm. But you will also have to invest in your enclosures and invest in ways keeping it keeping them alive 
Um, so I my estimate is that it will run into the thousands. All right. Okay, um, a question from Bernadette Alto, and uh, she's asking, what are the challenges? What, what challenges have you encountered during night field work? Are the ants collected similar, uh, uh, similar to the ones collected during the day? Oh yeah, thank you for those questions. Uh, the challenge is uh, first to put together the team. So for me, it was to find the bribe that would allow them to, to fall into the trap of having to work with me at night. <laughs> no, actually it was fun. But uh, really the challenge is uh, to know the terrain and to be safe. Uh, there are a lot of uh, possible dangers there. You might have snakes, you might have uh, poisonous things like centipedes fall on you when you beat uh, the trees, right? And so there are uh, perils, there are threats, and you just have to be safe. Um, otherwise, it's just the additional effort that you need to do work, field work at night. When you know everybody else in the camp is drinking beer and telling stories already while you're still out collecting your specimens. <laughs> are the ants collected similar? No, they are in fact different. There are those ants that are active only at night and you'll be able to find them using these techniques that I showed you. All right. Thank you. So any more questions from the audience? Actually, I have prepared two. Uh, we still have time. Sir, the question is about the, the ant that you showed earlier, the one that has a golden color. Um, sir, what is the possible uh, use of having a bright color uh, for, you know, Nocturnal ants. Parang feeling ko mas lalo sila makikita, di ba? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we didn't find uh, that ant until we worked on the nocturnal collecting. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it colored that way? Uh, it might also be that it's uh, it has developed its temporal behavior uh, late or, or recently. Recently meaning in the last couple of million years so that it has not yet needed to change color uh, you would expect that if they were nocturnal they would be differently colored maybe darker I don't know we we still don't know too much about nocturnal ants as I said they are poorly studied and we need to get more and more information to see what's going on about about these uh, nocturnal ants but yeah that's a good question why is a bright color ant active at night mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Pwede siguro kasi parang na nakikita nila yung isa't isa, no? <laughs> Naka-headlamp. Pwede sila naka-headlamp. And my second question is, um, sir, based on your uh, experience, how can you pinpoint a possible site that could harbor or could be, that could possibly have uh, nocturnal ants? There's no way, actually. Uh, I would think any locality where there is good forest, even second growth forest. Our study site, by the way, was second growth forest. Young trees, you can see mm -hmm. from the video, I was uh, striking a very young tree, maybe five years old or younger. Uh, it can be that. It can be uh, even disturbed areas. I remember in one island in northern Palawan, uh, there were ants in my bathroom at night. And then during the day, they were gone. So what I did was uh, the next night, I laid some bait for the ants to take home, uh, some pieces of fish. Mm -hmm. And I followed that ant carrying the fish down to its nest entrance. And it was a gap in the concrete steps of my rest house. There was a gap there, and that's where their nest was. Next morning, I looked at that nest entrance. Nothing. There was no activity. <laughs> I put some fish there to try to call them out. The fish was right there at the entrance of their nest. Other ants went for the, <laughs> for the bait. So they were completely and uh, basically just nocturnal. They All didn't right. want to be bothered. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, uh, I think... Uh, Two more questions here before I go to the question of uh, uh, 
Mr. Patano, let's go to a question by Beverly Cagod. And um, she's not uh, so familiar with ant sampling, but with regards to nocturnal ant sampling, what is the best time to start and end the sampling? Oh, very good question. The best time is probably after dinner. No, no, I take that back. Before dinner, so that they're hungry and, uh, yeah, I mean, hungry, they're the people working with you, your team. They're hungry and they're interested in getting done so that they can go back to the camp and eat and drink their beer and whatever and rest. Uh, basically, it's an imposition on your team to be out at night. Uh, so you have to be considerate also of their needs. Uh, so there's a bribe, maybe a tub of ice cream. No, no there, there can't be a tub of ice cream. But there is a bribe or at least some reward at the end of the sampling at night. Um, you can start as soon as it is dark. Depending on your locality and season, as soon as it is dark, you can start sampling. And ideally, your camp is near your transect stations so that there is a short walk in the dark that you need to traverse before you get back home. So okay. that's the best. All right, thank you. And uh, we'll be having our last question from Romeo Patano Jr. And what can you advise to, what, can, ad, what advice can you give to aspiring young myrmecologists? Okay, that's a very good question. First is uh, look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, do you really want to do this? No, basically, I take that back. Uh, you have to do the studies. You have to do the work. To learn ants, you have a very steep learning curve to learn the genre of ants, to learn how to identify them. But as long as you put in the work, uh, you put in the time and the patience, I think you will be able to succeed as a myrmecologist. Uh, you need your passion. You need to have your patience. You need to have uh, maybe hard-headedness in the face of uh, some difficulties and probably setbacks. As long as you're passionate about your science, I think you will succeed. And the measurement of success, success is when you are satisfied with what you're doing. As long as uh, you learn and continue to learn and encounter new species, that is the fun of uh, myrmecology. So I hope uh, uh, I encourage you to be a myrmecologist if that is your interest and I will be willing to guide you and mentor you along the way. Thank you for that question, Romy. Okay, thank you very much. Those are, uh, um, you know, uh, good words from the old myrmecologists to <laughs> the potentially new ones. Okay, thank you very much, Sir Dave, uh, for that presentation. And of course, to our audiences uh, here in Zoom and uh, YouTube, thank you very much for um, being with us. So before we proceed to the certificate of uh, recognition, let me just uh, stop my stream and then let me share my slide. So uh, we are giving the certificate of recognition. The Museum of Natural History awards this uh, certificate to Dr. David Emmanuel M. General for serving as the resource person uh, during today's uh, 2021 MNH Biodiversity Seminar entitled Working the Night Shift, Serving Nocturnal Ants with the Discovery of a New Species of Nocturnal Arboreal Ant. Uh, held uh, on um, today, June 9, 2021 from 10 o'clock to 11.30 a.m. Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. And in witness whereof, the signature of our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon, is hereby affixed. So maraming salamat, Dave. Congratulations. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Ed, please uh, check out our website, mnh.uplb.edu.ph and uh, you could write us at mnh.uplb at up that edu that page. We are on social media. Uh, do check us out in uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, like, follow, subscribe us. Um, just look for the handle UPLB Museum and do check out our 
uh, articles in Wikipedia and trip advice or the recording of this uh, webinar will be posted later on our YouTube channel and do um, like and follow our Facebook account for our future uh, announcements on our webinars. Uh, incidentally, by next week, uh, Wednesday next week, we will have our third uh, MNH Quincentennial Commemorations webinar. And we have uh, Dr. Leticia E. Arfuang, our curator for herpetofauna, discussing the past 500 years, uh, a recall of uh, 500 years of uh, herpetofauna studies in the Philippines. So with that, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much.